Many historians date the birth of capitalism to this Scottish seaside town, Kirkcaldy, Great Britain. Here in 1776, Adam Smith completed the work The Wealth of Nations and introduced the world to the concept of the invincible hand. Since then, the so-called free world have used invincible hand as a metaphor for how market forces magically distribute resources most efficiently by having providers of products and services match and compete for market demand. And since then, the Brits have more or less embraced capitalism and especially one side of the British Parliament has elevated capitalism to a divine force. The baseline conservative take on capitalism has been that it's an unalloyed good. Capitalism! Yes! Popular capitalism is nothing less than a crusade. But today, to almost 250 years after Adam Smith completed The Wealth of Nations, the young Brits sing in a different tune. A survey by the Institute of Economic Affairs revealed in 2021 that 67% of Britons between 16 and 35 want to live in a socialist economy. That in itself is interesting, a youth rebellion against 250 years of practicing and romanticizing capitalism. However, it becomes even more interesting when you look at what lies behind the answers. In the study, capitalism is to a large extent associated with being too expensive. For example, 80% of the respondents blame capitalism for being the cause of the unaffordable housing crisis, and 72% want British Rail, one of the most expensive in Europe, to be nationalized again. The invincible hand, which was supposed to ensure the goods produced most efficiently and thus the cheapest, doesn't seem to work according to its basic reasoning. And since the British economy isn't something of a pickle, perhaps the Brits need to ask themselves, can we really afford capitalism. It's entrenched poverty. It's been this way for many, many years. People are poor. They don't have enough money really to live. Part one, public underfunding. The crown jewel of UK social consciousness, the National Health Service, is in a gigantic crisis. A waiting list of more than 7 million hour-long ambulance queues in front of hospitals and 130,000 unfilled positions have not only led to chaos, but also to tragic deaths. It's been excess mortality, so this is the number of excess deaths compared to an average, and that's been running somewhere between about 800 to nearly 1,500 patients extra per week. The cause of the crisis seems to a large extent to be a question about underfunding. There are many suggestions as to why underfunding is such a big problem. Some say corona and more expensive treatments. Brexit is also blamed. Others go with 13 years of Tory austerity and bombastic incompetence. Either way, there is simply not enough money. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Who wouldn't? Enough money is a more interesting answer than we may first think. Because when the financial sector needs more money, the Bank of England just prints more money. We saw it most recently in connection with Liz Truss's disastrous mini-budget, where the Bank of England had to print and buy financial assets for £65 billion to keep a hand on the British pension funds. However, printing money and buying up financial assets is nothing new for the Bank of England. Since the 2008 financial crisis, money printing reserve for purchasing financial assets, particularly government debt, has been a cornerstone of the Bank of England's monetarist policy. Via the so-called quantitative easing programs, the Bank of England had, at the beginning of 2023, a balance sheet of more than £1 trillion, corresponding to 48% of the UK's GDP. The particular form of QE benefits, above all, banks, who have lots of assets, uh, which are inflated by QE, and uh, people with assets generally. So why doesn't the Bank of England just print some money so we have enough money for nurses, doctors, ambulance drivers, medicine, equipment, etc, etc. We can have nice things and this idea that we can, you know, print money for the billionaires or for the banks and not for the people is bad. It's not a coherent idea and anyone that tells you so is gaslighting. It's not like I want to advocate that we solve fundamental systematic problems in an economy with a money printer. However, no matter how you twist it, if it feels an ideological prioritization, after all, printing one trillion pounds isn't free. 
The QE programs during the corona crisis are often highlighted as one of the leading causes of the current inflation crisis, and the various injections on quantitative easing have since 2009 been a significant factor of the UK's severe inflation in the housing market. Furthermore, it disrupts the market mechanisms, which also cost money. We'll get to that in the next chapter, by the way. The fact that the political establishment can defend this sort of money printing is, of course, linked to the fact that the financial sector is a foundation for a functioning economy, but we can use the same argument about the health sector. They save lives every day, they work extraordinarily hard. Why should a chief executive be paid 14 times more than a nurse? If people are sick, they cannot work, which reduces economic productivity. Currently, a record 2.5 million Britons are economically inactive due to ill health. Such a number will, of course, never be zero, but it emphasizes that a well functioning health sector directly affects an economy's productivity. Particularly worth remembering this connection is that many of the most productive and important jobs in the economy are often in industries exposed to occupational injuries. Despite that, the health sector is more likely to be referred to as a public expenditure rather than a value-creating productive sector. On the other hand, the financial sector has been adept at selling itself as productive and value-creating, although it's difficult to explain how much, less little, it contributes. The um, national accounting statisticians have to make up a fictional value and just add it onto GDP and say, okay, that's, we can say that maybe is, is what the financial sector is doing. Because essentially, there is no value added, there's value extracted. Banker's default counter-argument is that financial institutions lend money to companies. The companies will then use this money to invest in new products, hiring new employees, technological upgrades, research, etc. Those investments result in economic growth, but that argument has a problem. Today's modern banks give extremely few loans to companies. I discover that lending to non-financial business amounted to less than 3% of the total assets of British banks. It's not only the health sector that is affected by austerity. The same is true of the education sector, where it's very straightforward to argue how it creates growth compared to the financial sector. Children come in as illiterate, unproductive brats and come out as engineers, doctors, software developers, feng shui consultants, etc. etc. With that in mind, it seems tragicomic that the UK, to such a large extent after the financial crisis of 2008, chose to put the trust in the financial sector's ability to restore the British economy, the same sector that had destroyed it. 15 years after the 08 crash, it seems obvious that doctors, nurses, teachers, childcare workers, therapists, researchers and workers in public infrastructure projects could have done a much better job and probably done it for a price the UK could actually afford. Part 2. Privatizations Britain is a proud naval nation. However, it is far from something that evokes memories of Lord Nelson and James Cook's naval battles as behind British waters making headlines these months. So the English privatised water monopolies are sorry for turning your beaches and your rivers into sewers. Knocking on a door and asking the owners to clean up after themselves is easier said than done. Foreign investment firms, private equity, pension funds and businesses lodged in tax havens own more than 70% of the water industry. This system of private monopolies began in 1991 after Conservative Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher sold the then publicly owned water and sewage sector in England and Wales for £7.6 billion to private shareholders. That the water privatisation, I believe, will go very successfully indeed. She promised a new golden era with investments to improve water quality and stable prices. The reasoning behind the decision also makes sense, at least on the surface. If you own a share in a water company, you want the value of this share to be as high as possible when you sell it again. In theory, you can ensure this by voting for the necessary investments in plants and facilities. To register for a prospectus in the water share offers, call 0272 272 272. However, something completely different has happened. Instead, the value of these shares has more or less followed the general boom and bust cycles on the global financial markets. Here's the share price for United Utilities, the water company with the longest history on the London Stock Exchange. The price of their shares rose significantly in the noughties during the housing and stock bubble, 
and like many other financial assets, crashed after the financial crisis in 2008. From approximately 2012, when the Bank of England and other major central banks accelerated the QE programs, the stock rose towards and later above the value it had before the financial crisis. Like many other stocks, it hit record highs during the COVID pandemic, when financial markets again were kept artificially high with even more QE money printing. Banks were the institutions that basically trashed the real economy and they trashed their own mechanisms. If the value of one's share is determined mainly by global boom and bust cycles, one could be tempted not to care much about how the company is being run by using one's share in the water company to vote for shareholders being paid a lot in dividends, for expenses to be written off as debt, and otherwise spend as little money as possible on maintaining water and sewage infrastructure. The water companies are not run in the interests of people who rely on water services. Leading to? Uh, well, leading to more leaks, um, dividends going to line the pockets of BlackRock asset managers uh, in, in America. There are many indications that the shareholders in the English water companies have thought just this way. From 1991 to 2022, the shareholders of the English water companies paid themselves 65.9 billion in dividends, corresponding to more than 2 billion per year. While these dividends have been paid to the shareholders, the water company's total debt has grown to approximately 54 billion pounds. This also means that 20% of customer income goes to service debt and pay dividends. There are even examples of banks using English water companies as a financial instrument to eliminate some of their own debts. The debt which Macquarie Funds had used to buy Thames Water in the first place had been transferred over to Thames Water's accounts using the Thames Water Cayman Island subsidiary. Meanwhile, the British sewage infrastructure is in such a bad state that in 2022, untreated sewage was flushed into the sea and rivers more than 300,000 times. Not only were most of these flushes illegal and disgusting, but for instance also an increasing health problem, something that prevents the building of new homes as new homes require increased sewage capacity and it's not exactly the best news for the British tourism sector. In other words, it's a considerable expense for the rest of society. The pollution hurt businesses which depend on the river. It poisoned fish and wildlife and affected the health of some river users. The privatization of the rail network also appears to be costing the British a lot of money on a daily basis, with the Brits both having some of the most expensive ticket prices and most delays in Europe. The privatization of the electricity companies hasn't been a cheap affair either. During the inflation crisis in 2022, the British paid the highest prices for electricity in the world, giving the poorest Britons the choice of heating or eating. This year we've seen poverty that is on a different scale altogether, and for some families it is a real stark choice of heat or eat. Part 3 housing inflation. According to QS World University Ranking's latest list, four of the world's 10 best universities are located in the United Kingdom. The University of Cambridge is number two, Oxford number three, with London's Imperial College and University College number six and nine respectively. That is impressive to say the least, and these four universities are even located within a radius of 50 kilometers. The London metropolitan area, of which universities are either a part of or an extension of, has more than 14 million inhabitants. The city is Europe's most diverse metropolis, and its workforce is the highest educated globally. In other words, London is a bit better for the spot on earth with the most so-called human capital. Human capital. Things like creativity, things like innovative capacity of workers and individuals. Things like risk attitudes, attitudes towards risk, attitudes towards entrepreneurship, abilities to manage risk, abilities to manage different forms of entrepreneurship. In addition, with 250,000 millionaires in the city, there is also access to plenty of local venture capital and via the financial center, City of London, access to infinite global venture capital. Moreover, the city's mother tongue is the world's lingua franca, with such a capital as a locomotive for the country's economic growth, the UK seems to have built the foundation for being among the world's strongest economies. However, the truth is quite different. The UK is an economic storm that is structurally so deep that Polish wages are projected to be higher than British wages as early as 2030. 
five. In 2000, average GDP per capita in the UK was over three times that of Poland. But with the UK economy stuck in a trap of low growth, a forecast suggests that by 2035, Polish wages could exceed that of the UK. The fact that Polish wages are projected to be higher than British wages as early as 2035 leaves an essential question. What the fuck happened? What is stopping all that human capital from flourishing and materializing into products and services that can enrich the UK? A reasonable suggestion would be the country's housing and rent inflation. That suggestion is, for instance, supported by a study which revealed that 74% of UK business leaders believe that high housing costs negatively affect their business. Landlords, uh, they win either way. So the more successful you are, the more rent they ask for. Uh, the less successful you are, uh, the more demanding they are for the rent. So the Yimby Alliance suggests that the unaffordable housing crisis results in such significant production losses that the UK's GDP would be between 25 and 30% higher if the housing crisis had not happened. Logically, it makes sense too when one's expenses for rent and mortgages take up such a large chunk of one's salary. It is, for example, difficult to save up money to start a business. This also means you must earn a lot of money before quitting your day job and dedicating yourself to your business full time. Many landlords also not particularly enthusiastic about people with loose ties to the labor market, so even being allowed to live in UK cities as self-employed can be challenging. If you already own a business running, it would be more expensive due to high rent, both because it requires some physical premises to run a business and because your employees will ask for wages that correspond to the rent level in the city. If you want to understand where this and other kinds of inflation comes from, there are two primary perspectives to consider. Inflation is caused by too much money. Chasing after too few goods. If we start with too few goods, you can see that in the 80s under Margaret Thatcher, the UK almost stopped building more council houses. In regards to too much money, we have already mentioned that the Bank of England and other central banks have printed a great deal of money in the past 15 years. However, we should also examine how private banks print slash create money. And private banks' money printing is described this way on Bank of England's website. Most of the money in the economy is created, not by printing presses at the central bank, but by banks when they provide loans. Therefore, if you borrow £100 from the bank and it credits your account with the amount, new money has been created. It didn't exist until it was credited to your account. It may sound abstract to imagine how money appears out of thin air, but let's say you want to buy a house in the London district of Putney and you have an account with the bank Barclays. You go to them and get a loan of £500,000. Barclays doesn't collect £500,000 from the bank vault, neither digitally or physically. No. Instead, they simply open up a computer and type some numbers into your account. You get a huge wad of money in your account and you also get a huge wad of debt that you'll be repaying over the next 25 years. In Putney, you find an apartment that you buy for these £500,000 from someone who has HSBC as their bank. Now Barclays will theoretically need to find £500,000 to transfer to HSBC but they may not need it after all, as their money will be a pending transaction for some time. Barclays may be lucky that I'm also house hunting, and in this example, I am an HSBC customer, and all like to buy property in the London neighbourhood of Williamson Green. HSBC gives me a loan of £500,000, and I transfer them to the old owner of the house, who in this example has a Barclays account. Now there is a pending transaction of £500,000 from Barclays to HSBC, and a pending transaction of £500,000 from HSBC to Barclays. The amounts offset each other. Now none of these banks need to transfer any money. Two houses have been bought with money created out of thin air, and you and I are paying the banks money every month as interest and installments for the money the banks have created out of thin air. When they make a loan, they create the deposit. Right there. Banks create money. Out of thin air. And since it's money created out of thin air, the banks can support bidding rooms for the current housing stock that an almost endless supply of money, pushing prices higher and higher up. And not only that, bank customers who are rich or has a high credit score can easier access less loan this new money created out of thin air. They're likely to access the money at a lower interest rate, and the poor may not even be able to access this new money at all. With the new money created out of thin air, the rich can outbid those who are not, 
for instance, as buy-to-let lane loans are through gentrification. It might seem good for you if you can get a mortgage, but if the rich are lending more, then that means everybody can get a big mortgage. And that means you are competing with people who can get big mortgages. And what that means is it becomes impossible for ordinary middle-class people to buy property without taking a massive mortgage. So can the UK afford capitalism? Well, it's more complicated than simply stating capitalism can't fucking afford it. However, what's clear is that capitalism is not free. You may not pay for it through your taxes, but through an expensive housing market, bad public services, sacrifice to keep the financial sector afloat, lack of productive investment, pollution, bailout, insane shareholder profits, etc. etc. And if a capitalism is done for a particularly uncritical mindset, governments may end up creating financial instruments and structures that very literally channel money from the public to the rich and take money from productive and resourceful economic activities to give to rich people sitting on hours somewhere on the globe trading digits on a computer screen.